Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to our event tonight, presentation by Ambassador Jairo Hernandez, the Director of Foreign Policy uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Costa Rica. Tonight's lecture is entitled, The Challenges of a Disarmed Democracy in the Path to Sustainable Development. My name is Eric Giordano. Uh, I am the director of the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, located here at UW Marathon County. And I'd like to thank uh, Dean Smith, Dean of the campus, for hosting this event here and for her support of the Wisconsin Institute. I'm also grateful that we have uh, a very attentive staff who have helped to put this event together. And in particular tonight, I'd like to uh, say thank you to our interns uh, who will be here uh, with microphones to take questions, help the audience to uh, ask questions after the talk, and our intern coordinator, Ian Reese. So thank you very much for your help. This forum was made possible by generous donations from the Clay Norbaum family, as well as from Kevin Hermaning, and it is part of an annual series that we call the Global Issues Forum, and we're grateful to be able to uh, have this uh, annual event. We'd like to ask you at this time to please turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices that might uh, interfere with the presentation tonight. And uh, also to, to please be respectful, especially when asking questions, to make sure that we're actually ask, asking questions at the appropriate time. Um, I'd also like to call attention to a couple of uh, uh, other events that we have upcoming. And I want to do this, get this out of the way now so we can get straight to the program. Uh, first of all, on October, sorry, tomorrow night, September 28th, uh, we're hosting on the campus here a series of presentations about the national debt. This is an, uh, uh, an event that's sponsored by the Nonpartisan Concord Coalition and the Wisconsin Fiscal Advisory Council. And we'll be hearing from a presentation, a live streamed presentation from Washington, D.C., uh, which includes Alice Rivlin, the budget director under President Clinton, now at the Brookings Institution, Brian Rydell, the Grover Herman Fellow in Federal Budgetary Affairs at the Heritage Foundation, and Robert Bixby, executive director of the Concord Coalition. So it is a bipartisan group. And they will be uh, delivering a panel tomorrow evening uh, this is from 6 to 8 p.m. in room 233 here on campus. And then questions will be fielded from uh, around the state of Wisconsin. Uh, here in Marathon County, this is one of six campuses that's hosting this, this live event. Uh, also, on October 11, we'll be hosting the Senator Feingold uh, candidate Ron Johnson debate here on campus in this room. And so that is free and open to the public. And then on October 23rd, I hope you'll mark your calendars because we have our official uh, kickoff and opening event for the opening of the, grant of the new building across the street with our new theater and offices, and that will be an event um, entitled The Promises and Perils of Democracy, and we'll be having uh, a visiting uh, head of the National Endowment for Humanities, Jim Leach, uh, Representative Dave Obey, Lieutenant Governor Barbara Lawton, uh, historian Brett Barker, and uh, County Administrator Brad Carter, moderated by former campus uh, Dean Jim Beninga. So that should be a very exciting panel, and we'd like to invite you, that's free to the public. And you can come and check out our new building. And then later in the month, on October 26th, we'll be hosting the uh, Sean Duffy, Julie Lassa debate, uh, hopefully also in the new building, if all the technology is set up and ready to go at that time. So we'll let you know as that's coming closer. So those are a few of our events that we've got coming up that we'd love to invite you to attend. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Ambassador Hernandez. Ambassador Hernandez obviously is a Costa Rican citizen with experience in the public sector and the private sector, in financial institutions, non-governmental organizations, foundations, and international organizations and in academia. For the past two years, he has served as the Deputy Permanent Representative of Costa Rica to, uh, sorry, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Costa Rica to the United Nations, which is obviously based in New York, 
and now holds the position of uh, Director of Foreign Policy in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the administration of recently inaugurated President Laura Chinchilla, who is, by the way, the first woman president in the history of Costa Rica. In the past, he worked as director of the, in the, of the president's office for President Jose Maria Figueres from 1994 to 1998, where he was able to work closely with the president in advancing sustainable development priorities among many other tasks. Uh, he is a graduate of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy with a Master of Arts in Law and Diplomacy. He's a former Fulbright Scholar, uh, a U.S. Institute for Peace Fellow, and the list of accomplishments really is, is too long to list. Uh, but I do want to also let you know that he is an incredible uh, human being and humanitarian, uh, a very kind individual as well as an excellent uh, policymaker. So it's my absolute privilege to welcome tonight uh, Jairo Hernandez. Yeah, good evening. Um, thank you, Eric, for the presentation. Uh, I'm very grateful to Dean Smith and to Eric Giordano and all the people who have helped uh, put together this presentation. Uh, this is my first time here to the state of Wisconsin, and I am very privileged to be among you and try to share with you some of the views about a small country in Central America, um, probably 25, 30 years ago, Costa Rica was not a very well-known country. You know, I remember that in those years, many people used to mistake Costa Rica for Puerto, Puerto Rico. You know, it was very common to do that. But nowadays, I mean, Costa Rica is well-known. There is always somebody that you know or yourselves who have probably been to Costa Rica because of, of its uh, recent advertisement as an... Uh, suitable country for eco-adventures or nature-oriented adventures. Just give you a basic facts about what Costa Rica is. You know, as you know, it's a country in Central America. You know, we have borders with Nicaragua, and Panama, the Pacific Ocean to the west and south, and the Caribbean Sea to the east. Costa Rica, we don't have states. I mean, we call them provinces, you know, as many countries do. And each province at the same time is divided into cantones. cantons. So we have seven provinces. You know. <coughs> Three of them are in the uh, border, the coasts, either the Pacific or the Atlantic. And the rest are in the central parts of the country. The, the capital is San Jose, which is where, where I live. Uh, weather there is relatively pleasant because we are in an elevation in a valley that we call the Central Valley, which is kind of like 4,000 feet above sea level. So we have a kind of a s same temperature all year round, probably between, can reach 80 during the day, but can go to 65, even less during the night time. It's, we don't have four seasons like you do here in the States because we are right there in the middle of the tropics. So we have just rainy season and dry season. You know. uh, as you see, it's a very small country, nearly 20,000 square uh, miles, which is the states of Vermont and New Hampshire combined. Uh, a lot of that people live in the Central Valley, as you can see, because the population is probably nearing 4.5 to 5 million, of which probably 10% is immigrants from other uh, neighboring countries. You know. and San Jose concentrates a lot of, of those people because it is the economic and business and political center of the country. Is Costa Rica unequivocally a tropical country with two seasons, as I was saying? However, uh, being a small in area, Costa Rica has a, a lot of diversity in terms of, of nature, of climates. For example, as you can see there, the highest point of the country is 12,530 feet, which is a national park, the Chiripo, where you can, with a special permit, you can climb. It's quite very cold there, but it's a very impressive view. You can see the, both the Pacific and the Atlantic from there. There are two spots in Costa Rica where you can 
see that the both oceans, you know, the only spots in the world where where you are able to to see that, you know, and and we have a lot of several climatic zones, you know, that provides a lot of biodiversity. In fact, Costa Rica has probably nearly between one and two percent of the world's biodiversity, you know, with a lot of species for many things. Is in fact, Costa Rica has become a natural laboratory for for studies and scientific studies on, on, on many things. You know, we have, for example, a, a very world-renowned National Institute of Biodiversity, which conducts a lot of these things. They are all the time uh, trying to study new species for to detect possible uses for pharmaceutical reasons or, or, or things like that. Costa Rica literally translates as rich coast. In 1502, when Christopher Columbus came to the Americas on his fourth trip, he, he was there, stationed near the coast of the Caribbean side of the Costa Rican land. And when he saw the, the beauty of the nature, the palm trees and the beach and all that, he, he thought this must be a rich coast. And that's why the name came from, you know, because of Christopher Columbus. And it is the only Latin country included in the list of the world's 22 older democracies. You know? Costa Rica has consistently been among the top Latin countries in terms of the Human Development Index and ranked 54th in the world in 2007. There are a lot of indexes nowadays. I know that one recent publication listed also the indexes of the happiest countries in the world, and Costa Rica ranked among the top Three, you know, and they, I don't know how they do it, but they, you know, survey different indicators that come to the conclusion of what makes a country the happiest place. Uh, among other things, Costa Rica is very strong in human development indicators. The literacy rate is one of the highest in the region, you know, 96% according to the UN Human Development Report. And this rate that Costa Rica has attained over the years is primarily due to an elementary public school system which is free and mandatory to all children between the ages of six and 13. Yeah. And so, as, as it happens nowadays in the global economy, I mean, the more incentives the, the, a country gives to education, you know, that eventually proves its dividends and, and Costa Rica, to a certain extent, has been a, an example of that. Costa Rica became independent from Spain with the rest of Central American nations in 1821. I don't know if you were aware, but last, last week, uh, Mexico uh, celebrated 200 years of independence from Spain. They had theirs in 1810, you know. In fact, that day, President Calderón of Mexico sent his, its, his presidential plane to Costa Rica to bring the president of Costa Rica to join him in the celebrations in Mexico City, you know, for the 200 uh, years. And so Costa Rica and the other four historical countries of Central America, which are Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Honduras, will do the same on September 15th of 1821, which is that at that time, Costa Rica was a very isolated uh, region of Central America, the colonial capital during the 300 years of, of a Spanish colonial kingdom, the, the main center, the main political and economic center was Guatemala City. You know, Costa Rica was the most remote and isolated province. But in 1821, in Guatemala City, you know, the congressmen there decided that they needed to, to become free from Spain. For three years after that, the whole province of Central America, I mean, became part of Mexico, you know, under the empire of Iturbide. And in 1824, they decided to form a federal republic, you know, what we call the Federal Republic of Central America. But that didn't work and didn't last for many years because there were conflicts in each country. And in 1838, Costa Rica was the first country to announce that it was going to separate from the Federal Republic. And in 1838, each one of those five nations became independent republics. You know? And in a way, as it says there, a different kind of leadership proved to be fundamental in Costa Rica's democratic path. Our first leader during the regional federal cycle is a teacher, was a teacher, while our first head of state in 1838 stressed rule of law and civilian rights. So in a way, very early Costa Rica identified itself as a country with, with some kind of different characteristics compared to, to other neighboring countries. 
the traditional influence of the coffee growing plantation. During the 19th century, coffee and later bananas became the main products of Costa Rica, you know. And of course, there was a coffee elite, you know, that became, you know, very successful. And even that, the traditional influence of the coffee growers was broken in 1889 when a democratic constitution was adopted, you know. Costa Rica was to become the best functioning democracy of Latin America with a slogan, education, democracy, and peace. And among other things, the death penalty was banned in 1877, so there is no death penalty in our criminal system. You know? And in 1886, free schooling was introduced. In 1889, the first true democratic election took place. Costa Rica has long emphasized the development of democracy and respect for human rights. And, and that is also present in our foreign policy. For example, last week that I was in New York City accompanying my president and the foreign minister in the, all the meetings of, that traditionally take place once a year at the United Nations, you know, the General Assembly and all that, all the bilateral meetings or the meetings that we, we try to, to go to are usually focused on, on, on those issues, you know, of human rights, uh, disarmament, because those things we believe are they are very consistent with our internal domestic traditions. You know. The country's political system has steadily developed, maintaining democratic institutions and an orderly constitutional scheme for government succession. In the 20th century, we only had two brief interruptions to that. In 1917, and in 1948, as we will see later. But other than that, since 1950 and on, Costa Rica has celebrated uh, elections every four years, you know, which are managed by a uh, independent uh, electoral body, you know, independent from the Congress, independent from the executive branch. And Costa Ricans are assured that uh, the elections will be competitive and fair without any in political interference. Several factors have contributed to this trend, including enlightened leadership, comparative prosperity, flexible class lines, educational opportunities that have created a stable middle class and high social indicators. Also, because since 1948, Costa Rica has no armed forces, no army, it, is, it has avoided the military involvement in political affairs, unlike other countries in the region. And the other advantage, I would say, for the, all those generations like mine that grew up in a country without an army. You know, the other big peace dividend is that that money that other, for example, countries in Latin America use in heavy military equipment and armies, I mean, we have been able to use that in, in programs, I mean, so education, health, and all that. From 1870 to 1940, as a foundation of modern democracy, um, Costa Rica's involvement in the world economy became, as I said before, dependent, largely dependent on coffee and bananas until the late 20th century when that changed. And why do I say that? Because nowadays, I mean, we no longer depend on coffee and bananas. I mean, we still produce coffee and bananas and we try to, for example, advertise coffee more as, as not as, as, uh, as we used to do in the 19th century. I mean, it's very difficult to compete nowadays with simple coffee because Vietnam, for example, ex exports a lot since 15, 20 years ago. So what we do is try to promote certain top quality gourmet cafe to have better prices, you know, as, as Colombia does, I mean, with, with some brands like Juan Valdez or something, so Costa Rica is trying to do something like that. Um, but we no longer depend only on coffee. Same with, with, with bananas. I mean, if, if you ask me what is the first export of Costa Rica right now, I don't know, probably would be hard for you to guess that is Intel microchips processors, you know? I mean, that's Intel established in 1997 a factory in Costa Rica that has 3,000 uh, workers, you know, in, in, in a way with a lot of high tech, and so a lot of the, those chips are exported to the US and to China and Korea to, because they are parts of the chain, you know, supply of, of computers, you know, that, uh, that computers need to use those, those things. In the early 40s, a conservative president introduced liberal reforms. Uh, and when I say conservative and liberal, I'm not, it's not the same for us as here in the US, you know, it's completely different. A liberal I know here in the US is more, uh, left, 
wing. No, I mean, for us, liberalism more has to deal with the uh, political liberalism. You know that we believe in freedoms and things like that. Is that does not entail a, 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 a ideological label. You know, so uh, in the forties, uh, this, this president uh, included a lot of. Uh, important policies, workers' rights, minimum wages. For example, the labor code was enacted. As, as I was saying to earlier to some people, we don't follow the common law system than you do here in the US. We follow more the Roman law system, which we inherited from Spain, and which was you know, mainly achieved during the Roman Empire. You know? So a lot of our legal institutions come from the Roman times. And we have codes for everything. I mean, it's not here that judges have to take into account what other judges, uh, I mean, did in the past in Costa Rica. We have a code for criminal code, the family code, and judges have to decide based on what is written there in the code. You know. So in 1942, we enacted a, a labor code, which states all the rights for workers and things like that, which is, was a very advanced for that time. You know. In 1948, a six-week civil war took place over a disputed presidential election result, and the winner, Don Pepe Figueres, stayed in power for 18 months to lay the foundations of a modern welfare state with a new constitution that established check and balances, gave women and people of African descent the right to vote, and he was the instrumental uh, leader who uh, abolished the army you know, in 1948. Um, during the modern era of Costa Rica, I mean, he became president twice after that. You know, and there was a survey at the end of the 20th century to all Costa Ricans to decide who was the person of the century, of the 20th century. And by far, by a majority of 70 or 75% of the Costa Ricans said that he was the person of the century. He already passed away. His son was president in the mid-90s, and I used to work for his son when he was president. Contemporary Costa Rican society was shaped by the political system that emerged in the aftermath of the brief 1948 civil war. So our current political system, political parties, in a way, come from this time, you know, the mid-20th century. Local social democratic oriented insurgents fought the war in large part to transform the country's coffee and banana based export economy and to break the agro exporters oligarchic monopoly of political power. So Figueres in a way brought a new stream of a new stream of people into power, you know, into the economic power, political power. The new leaders also built on the social reforms enacted during the first part of the 40s. The victorious leaders created the conditions to ensure a middle-class-based society within a s with a social security system that privileged education, health, and infrastructure. The state contributed to stability by absorbing real and potential socioeconomic social e conflict and by conciliating opposing interests. In a way, this welfare system worked well for, I would say, 30 years. After that, in the 90s and in this century, uh, the country has been experiencing a transition because we are part now of a global community, a global world. We are no longer isolated. You know, for many years during the welfare system, Costa Rica was the only peaceful country, democratic country in Central America, so we could do things by ourselves. But as of the 90s, I mean, uh, as you all know, I mean, the, the world became very interconnected, you know, because of communications because of uh, new financial rules uh, you know across the the world and many things that made us you know be you know in 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 full in, in interaction you know, one country with with another so this this welfare system is still survives in a way but uh, Costa Rica has been able to to adapt to to the new circumstances by opening its economy to the to the rest of the world our constitution in 1949 provides a new distribution of power with checks and balances. The electoral supervision, as I said before, we have a, a, an electoral body which supervises our elections. You know, the, there is like a fourth branch. You know that the traditional branches are executive, legislative, 
judiciary, but we have a fourth one, which is the electoral, because there are judges that supervise and oversee our, el our elections every four years. You know? For example, in December, we will have uh, elections for mayors on the 81 cantones of the country. So the executive branch, the Congress, they don't do anything. You know, the electoral court does the, 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 the whole work. And as a symbolic measure, three days prior to the presidential election, the president of Costa Rica hands the control of the civilian police that we have instead of an army to the electoral court, you know, so that they are in charge of the security during the electoral times. The Constitution reflects the typical Costa Rican attitudes of reserve approval of government and fear of concentrated power and the belief that law is essential to the order and legitimacy of social reality. In a way, Costa Rica, we have a lot of laws. You know, sometimes we, we hate our congressmen because we are, they are enacting bills and laws for everything, you know, and sometimes we don't like that. But in a way, it's because Costa Rica is a very respectful country of the rule of law, both domestically and internationally. When I was at the United Nations a few, uh, you know, in recent years, you know, Costa Rica, we had a big sour disputes with, for example, Sudan, you know, because Costa Rica was the, trying to, to, to make or to support that the, that the president of Sudan be brought to the International Criminal Court, you know, uh, for all the genocides and the crimes that he's committing, and, and that was consistent with our domestic policies, you know, that, that you cannot do that, those things, you know, in this modern world. Since the 1980s, as I said before, Costa Rica began to transform its export model, no longer the traditional exports like coffee and bananas were the, the only thing. We started to replace coffee and bananas with, as I said, with high-tech services, high-tech oriented industries. But we also added other agricultural things that with more value added. For example, Costa Rica is the first exporter of pineapple in the world right now. We export melon, uh, we export fresh flowers every day from Costa Rica to Miami. Florida, you know, fresh flowers that will be available there in the in the flower places in Florida, and and I would say 20 years, 25 years ago, Costa Rica only exported like 30 or 40 products. Now the list is of 4,000 products. You know, so, so that's a big change in our economy, and of course uh, the other big thing that happened in the last 25 years is tourism. You know. I mean, nowadays, Costa Rica receives up to two million tourists a year, you know, which is, I mean, for a small country, I mean, big thing. The U.S. is still our main provider of tourists, you know, um, alongside with Canada and Europe, and increasingly, of course, other Central American and Latin American countries. You know, we, we are introducing now a lot of, uh, of flaws or, or possibilities for from other Latin countries. So it's more common to see a Chilean tourist coming to Costa Rica or an Argentinian or Brazilian because the connections are much easier. You know, now there are flights from Costa Rica direct to most South American countries without having to come to the United States as it was before. Costa Rica suffer, suffered the effects of a Cold War confrontation in the region. You know, in the 80s, I don't know if some of you remember, but most of our neighbors were in, in experiencing civil wars, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, you know, not Honduras, but Honduras was kind of unstable in the middle. And we had a president in the 80s that he kind of brought a, or, or launched a peace proposal. You know, at that time, both the United States and the Soviet Union, you know, were in a, still in the bipolar war, you know, the Cold War era, you know, the, still the Soviet Union was a very, strong power, and Central America became like a test case of, of, of the both superpowers, you know, and, and this Costa Rican president said, you know, that the only way to resolve the crisis in Central America was to let the un-Central American countries decide their future, you know, and so he launched a peace plan with a very strict specifications, and because of that he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1987, you know, which it was a very important thing to end the wars in the future. That was in 87, the civil war in the peace agreements in, in El Salvador were reaching 92, in Guatemala in 96, 
and a democratic election replaced the Sandinista regime in Nicaragua in 1990. So there were very specific, concrete dividends of that peace process. You know? um, also, the post-regional conflict in the 90s brought new realities and opportunities. I mean, I would say that in the last 20 years, Costa Rican governments have mixed both state and market policies. You know, during the first 30, 40 years, there was a, a strong government control of many things. That has changed. You know, now the market is very important too. The, I mean, the private sector is very influential too in, Cos in the Costa Rican economy. Of course, the tourist boom. And the renewed emphasis in sustainable development and environmental protection. Maybe during the first stage of the welfare state, social and economic components were the only important things that matter. As of 1992, after the Earth Summit, as we will see, environmental issues began to, to become important too. You know? So we believe that sustainable development is eco economic, social, and environmental. You know? A service-based economy with focus on foreign direct investment and high-tech industries. You know, a lot of the trips, for example, before coming to New York, I was traveling with my foreign minister in Japan and Korea. And we will do the same thing in Singapore and India and China next month. And a lot of that is to, to learn from their experiences, how those countries were able to, to, to learn from innovation, you know, from, to upgrade their economies to, to where they are now. I mean, we were in Korea two weeks ago, and, and they were explaining us. They show us pictures of Seoul 50 years ago. Korea was a country poorer than Nicaragua, you know. And you could see the pictures there, you know. And right now, it's a country with a... GDP per capita of twenty thousand dollars, you know, U.S. dollars, very, very rich, very impressive, you know. And so, well, we still need to to learn a lot from 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 countries that have been relatively successful, and we are trying to focus, besides tourism, on foreign direct investment, high tech industries, because we 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 feel that we have the conditions for that. We have an educated labor, you know. I mean, Costa Ricans now are. We are trying to make Costa Rica become a bilingual or multilingual country. You know, people are learning English, but we are trying that people learn also Chinese or German or other languages because that's a big asset in this uh, world economy, in this global economy. Learning an additional or one or two additional languages is a very important thing. And we are trying to pursue a more strategic involvement with the rest of the world. And that's why, for example, for the present administration, our links with the Asia Pacific region are very important. To preserve the friendly relations with the United States is also important. I mean, to try to, to cope with the different challenges of Latin American countries. We know that Latin America is today a very fragmented region, but but that's our region, you know, that we need to be very close to our Central American neighbors and do things together. Uh, there might be some governments in the region that we probably do not have many things in common, but still, I mean, we need to work together. The last administration, you know, a year ago, two years ago, I mean, I would say our president right now, Laura Chinchilla, I mean, uh, three weeks ago she received for the first time in 40 years the credential letters of a Cuban ambassador, you know, we didn't have diplomatic relations with Cuba since 1960 when most of the community in Latin America broke relations with Cuba. Well, we, we, we felt that that had to change. I mean, we might not agree, I mean, with a lot of the things of the Cuban regime, but that doesn't mean that we cannot have diplomatic relations with Cuba, same as we do with China. We change our relations from Taiwan to China, you know, because it's impossible to ignore China nowadays. Of course, some people may may ask, okay, but then you have to ignore certain human rights issues, you know, and things like that. I mean, of course, I mean, there will be some issues, you know, as the U.S. has, you know, U.S. big capitalist economy, and China still a communist regime, but with a very open economy, and so, well, that's, that's how the world is today, and we need to, you know, to cope with all those situations. Just to talk about a little bit about our party system, that president that you see there is so the, the one who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1987. Our electoral system, I mean, we have a presidential system like in the US. I mean, we, we don't have a parliamentary system like European countries. But uh, the difference between the US system and the Costa Rican system is that we have, we vote directly for the president. We don't vote, you know, for a college. 
that in the end technically decides who is the president. And we required a 40% of the popular vote to elect the president. Since, 19, since in the new constitution, only once we have had a runoff second election because somebody didn't reach 40%. And that happened in 2002. And there were some fears that in this last election, last February, that was going to happen, but it didn't happen. I mean, this woman who became president won with 47% of the election, you know, and her main opponent reached only 25%. So she, she won big, you know, with 22 points lead, you know. So from 53 to 82, we had mainly one strong party and a main opposition force, which was a coalition of parties. From 82 and 98, I would identify this uh, period as the very similar to the US. Two big parties, you know, that took 95% of the popular vote. That changed in 2002 when one of those parties weakened, you know, and practically doesn't exist anymore because of some internal problems they had and some presidents who were put in jail because of corruption charges, you know. So 2002 to 2010, we have been in transition to a multi-party system with one main party, which is still the green and white in power right now, and other emerging political forces and one declining party, which is the one that used to be a very strong party before. In the last election, Costa Rica votes its first woman president. We had a 70% of turnout, vote you know, participation. The voters supported continuity with a renewed leadership. We don't have a re-election, consecutive re-election. So the, the party in power right now is the same party that was in the last four years. President Arias was president, and now President Chinchi is president. Same party, but a president, if, if the president wants to be re-elected, he uh, has to wait eight years after the term ends. You know? So you serve one term, you step out two terms and you can run again after eight years. I mean, th there is not like here that you can run another term, you, you can. So the ruling party obtains 47%, the main opposition parties obtain 25 and 21%. Uh, Laura Chinchilla, a female president, is elected for, for the first time. You know, and so she was recently inaugurated last May. She's a 52-year-old political scientist, you know, um, a person who in the past, in her academic uh, backgrounds, she studied political science and did a lot of work in security studies and human rights uh, issues and things like that. So she came for the first time to the United Nations last week and she was honored to be the speaker number five in the general debate of the General Assembly that you know every year, always the first president to speak is always the president of Brazil and the second is the president of the United States because that's a tradition that is maintained since the charter was signed in San Francisco in 1945. And after those two speak, there is a lot of different criteria that allocate who speaks, you know, in that day or that afternoon and the following day. So it was the first time that Costa Rica gets to speak in that first session, you know, and she spoke as number five. Some issues, you know, based on our experience, Costa Rica, our voice in the world, as I was saying before, disarmament and non-proliferation are big things. Costa Rica is a firm advocate of disarmament, both conventional and nuclear weapons, you know. During its presidency in the Security Council, you know, Costa Rica just left the Security Council almost a year ago. You know, the Security Council is the main political body of the United Nations. There are only 15 members there, of which five are permanent. You know, the United States, UK, China, France, and Russia. But those five happen to be the main suppliers of arms and weapons in the world as well. So you, you can see, you know, it's a lot of interest there in the Security Council. The other 10 members rotate. There are always two from Latin America. So at that time was Costa Rica and Panama, then Costa Rica and Mexico. Right now it's Mexico and Brazil. So during our, and, and the presidency in the Security Council rotates in alphabetical order once a month. So we had the presidency of the Security Council in November 2008 and we sponsored a high-level debate strengthening collective security towards regulation and reduction of armaments. One of the leading countries, Costa Rica has been one of the leading countries to co-sponsor initiatives towards non-nuclear proliferation. And Costa Rica is one of the leading sponsors of the Arms Trade Treaty. You know, this is what President Arias said in that speech in September 2009 to the United Nations. 
What is the great enemy of Latin America that leads it to spend $165 million a day on weapons and soldiers? I assure you that these threats are far less significant than the threat posed by, for example, the mosquito that carries malaria. They are less than the threat posed by drug cartels and street gangs that sustain themselves thanks to an unrestricted market of small arms and light weapons. And this is one of the big problems that we are experiencing right now in Central America, including Costa Rica in a way. One of the major concerns that our president has to face right now is that you know, small arms, light weapons, drug cartels, you know, Central America is sandwiched between Colombia and Mexico. When Colombia became tough with the drug cartels, they moved to Mexico, and that explains what you see, all these deaths in Ciudad Juarez and in all this instability in Mexico, but, but they are advancing towards Central America. You know, Guatemala is in big risk right now, and, and, and so Costa Rica is not exempt from this problem. International justice and the fight against impunity. Costa Rica has systematically supported the fight against impunity and the role of the International Criminal Court. You know, and we played a leading role in the Sudanese case within the Security Council. You know, we, we feel that the Sudanese, the current Sudanese president should be indicted, you know, and be brought to the International Criminal Court for all the crimes that he has committed, you know, and other similar cases. Costa Rica fully supports the International Court of Justice as a means for peaceful settlement of disputes. For example, with Nicaragua, we had a recent dispute, or not a recent, but for many years, part of the border between Nicaragua and Costa Rica is the river, San Juan River, you know, Rio San Juan. And both countries have allegations of who has, I mean, the river belongs to Nicaragua. Nicaragua has the sovereignty over the river, but Costa Rica has the free rights of navigation in the river. You know, so but sometimes there have been arguments of you know, how to interpret this or that, and when we couldn't solve both Nicaragua and Costa Rica these problems, we decided to bring the case to the International Court of Justice in the Netherlands. You know. Costa Rica also stresses the importance of international justice to assure the sustainability of peace processes and believes in a fair and credible sanctions regime by the international community. So as you can see, all the things that we practice domestically, we try to to expand internationally and try to be consistent because after all the international policy of a country should be the expansion of its domestic interests of its domestic you know issues as well Costa Rica is an advocate of human rights protection and defends humanitarian causes you know? for example Costa Rica the headquarters of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights Costa Rica is a leading actor within the UN in areas such as human security. We are the chairmen of the Human Security Network in the UN. In fact, last Friday, while in New York, I had to chair this network of other 12 countries, including Canada, Slovenia, Greece, Mali, Jordan, Thailand, uh, Norway, Switzerland. So usually our alliances in, in, within the United Nations are countries that think or feel the same way about certain issues, you know. Responsibility to protect, humanitarian assistance in conflicts. During our uh, times in the Security Council, we were, we defended a lot, I mean, to protect civilians in conflicts, children to protect, I mean, against sexual violence, for example, in, in wars and things like that. We believe in an active role in peacekeeping, for example. We supported we support peace building. For example, Costa Rica led the UN Security Council mission to Haiti in 2009, you know, as a way to, to build peace, to build democracy there. And we believe in security sector reform, in other words, to promote reconversion of the military sector and the elimination of armies as far as it is possible. We understand that it is, would be impossible for some countries like the US to do the same, you know, because it's big powers, I mean, obviously need to have an army or China or Russia or things like that. But for small countries like Costa Rica, you know, example that has been followed all by other countries now like Panama, you know, that could make sense, you know, not to spend money in the military. And uh, a last point is that human sustainable development and environmental protection. The Earth Summit took place in 1992, you know, in Rio de Janeiro, in Brazil. And after that summit, environmental issues became predominant in the global agenda. You know, climate change is one of those issues, you know, biodiversity. I mean, the, for Costa Rica, it is important to preserve biodiversity. In fact, Costa Rica is the only country that has been able to, to eliminate deforestation, you know, and 20 years later, 
Now deforestation is not an issue. I mean, for many years, our country was being, you know, in big problem. You know, if you saw a map of Costa Rica, then a lot of desert-like, and right now it's green again, thanks to the policies that have been undertaken by, by the last governments. You know. And we aspire that in the year 2021, the, during the 200 years of independence, to become, to be one of the first countries to become carbon neutral, 2021, which is that achieving net zero carbon emissions by balancing a measured amount of carbon release with an equivalent amount sequestered or offset or buying enough carbon credits to make up the difference. I know this is very complex, very technical, but in a way it's just to, to be a carbon neutral country is to be a country that does not, you know, contribute to the problems of CO2, you know, in the world like, like right now happens. And there will be an important summit in Cancun, Mexico in December, you know, to deal with all these issues of, of what to do with climate change because what we do now probably will take effects in 150 years. And the big problem is that Political leaders around the world, they think in what's happening now, they don't really care about what's going to happen in 100 years. So that's a big problem with issues like this. Yeah. Current trends and dilemmas in a global context. So what to do? I mean, Costa Rica was a successful welfare state, but right now circumstances have changed. So people wonder, I mean, should we change? We know that every change is, is, is not comfortable, you know. When, when you change a situation in your real life, in your family, in your uh, job, or in your country, well, that, that, that's not a very easy thing. So for Costa Ricans, it's difficult to think that we need to evolve. I mean, to, to, I mean some things that, were, that proved to be successful in the past probably are no longer successful, and, and we need to think more about the future. Being competitive in a global economy means macroeconomic stability to keep our human development indicators, but at the same time to foster an alliance with nature. You know? We need to reach a long-term vision in a fragmented political society and increase power of interest groups. Costa Rica is not exempt from you know, a lot of interest groups and the media who put pressure on many different issues. You know, it's hard to cope with those things on a daily basis, and we feel that uh, it would be more successful for Costa Rica in the future to have a long-term vision beyond the four-year term of a government. You know, we need more a uh, state vision, like for example, countries like Korea or Singapore achieve. You know, they they launched a 25, 30-year plan, and they were able, you know, to, to do important things in those years. How to cope with pending poverty, crime, and insecurity problems while modernizing government institutions? You know. The average level of poverty in Latin American countries is about 55, 60%. You know, in Costa Rica, it's like 18%. So, but that means we still have to do something. Still one out of every five Costa Rican is still poor. You know, so we need to, to, to solve that situation. We need to reinvent education in a changing and demanding world. You know, the key to success in many societies is education. You know, you know, you know, good public education system, good regulation of private education. In fact, I mean, to strengthen our educational policies, you know, education right now, because of the transformation of technology, needs to be reinvented in a way, you know, and so, but, well, we have been doing interesting things. According to our constitution, 7% of our gross domestic product needs to be spent in education, you know, and we are about to, 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 to do that, to make it a reality, you know, but it's still, it's hard, you know, in a especially in a present financial constraints, you know, with the world crisis and all that, it's not easy to attain that. We need to strengthen and modernize our political system. I mean, it's not perfect. I mean, our political parties work, but we still need to do a lot of things, you know, to modernize our political institutions. We need to bring creative and innovative leadership. You know, when, when Laura Chinchilla was elected, you know, people, you know, were happy in general, but she, she has a challenge ahead of, you know, in these next four years. It's, it won't be an easy period for her. Uh, we need a long-term vision with legal and political adjustments, institutions, and state policies. And we cannot forget that we need a national vision within a regional context. I mean, whether we like it or not, Costa Rica is part of Central America. Maybe we don't have many things in common with some of the countries, but we are there. I mean, we are next to Nicaragua, next to Panama. You know, and sometimes 
some Costa Ricans, you know, don't don't like that idea, you know, because for for different reasons, you know, they 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 feel that it's not fair for Costa Rica to be there. But that's that's what it is, you know, and that's the reality, and Costa Rica has to cope with that. In the last three administrations, Costa Rica practically neglected Central America in our foreign policy. In this new administration, in which I am working with a new foreign minister, we are reversing that, and Central America becomes one of our priorities in our foreign policy because we 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 think that doing things together with our neighbors is a good thing to achieve things faster. And well, that's the end. Pura vida is something that we say in Spanish, you know, to express, uh, you know, when people say hello to to other people. But I'm happy to take any questions if you want something that might not be clear or something that you want me to, to expand I'll be glad to do it yes sir okay we have microphones here available for mm -hmm. I noticed on the slide that you had with uh, President Sinchila Mm -hmm. that she, in that election, when she was elected, it was 70% turnout. Mm -hmm. uh, by Costa Rican standards, is that a good turnout, a, an average turnout, or less than average? In proof, with respect to the last three elections, but normally the turnout used to be 82%. You know? I mean, all the elections from, I would say, 1953 until 1998, uh, the average turnout was uh, 82, 80%. In the election of 1998, 2002, people were not very happy with politicians in general. It happens in many parts of the world, you know, so they, for many reasons, you know, and so for three elections in a row, the turnout rate even went to 60%, 65%. So the fact that it went to 70%, it was a little improvement compared to what it was in the previous two elections, but not as still as it was in, in the past two or three decades. So I, I would say that Laura, Laura Chinchilla was able to capture a lot of support even beyond her, her political party for many things. She's young, she's a woman, it was an innovative thing because she's an, perceived as an honest person, you know, hardworking, that was not you know, not associated with the traditional politicians and things like that, and so probably that was a, an improvement. There's another question here. Well, I think we have a lot to learn from you, but one of the things that struck me when I was traveling in Costa Rica is some of the comments that I heard from the, the local people there about some of the difficulties you face with immigration, particularly from Nicaragua. Yes. I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah. So we were commenting earlier with some people, in a way, Nicaraguans and Costa Ricans is kind of a similar situation of what uh, in, in a moment, in a historical moment, the Mexicans and Americans face here, you know? I mean, Nicaraguans are doing the jobs in Costa Rica that Costa Ricans no longer do. Construction, uh, gardening, you know, babies, house sitting, you know, cleaning, those things, you know? Because Costa Ricans now do other things. So there is like a conflicting view, I mean, for, but, but I would have to recognize that there is a, still a high degree of intolerance of a lot of Costa Ricans, not only just in terms of Nicaraguans, but in, in general Costa Ricans, I mean, don't like to be perceived as Central Americans, because for Costa Ricans, Central America is source of instability, problems, army, so, and, so, and that's how kids grow, you know? When kids grow by the teachers in the school with all those things, sooner or later, well, that's, that's what you get, you know, stereotypes and things like that. So I, of course, I, I'm, I'm not in agreement with that. The fact that the three last administrations didn't pursue an active policy in Central America is because of those stereotypes. I mean, we are trying to break that because we feel that, yeah, we have, Nicaraguans in Costa Rica, but in a way they, they, they benefit our economy. They benefit, I mean, for some Costa Ricans, Nicaraguans only are taking our part of our social security system, of our resources, and that might be true. But in a way, I mean, without Nicaraguans, coffee wouldn't be exported. Without Nicaraguans, our buildings wouldn't be built, and many other things. So we're trying to create a culture of tolerance 
However, sometimes that's not easy because the governments in Nicaragua sometimes don't help. I mean, Nicaragua experiences a very difficult economic situation, and it's not just because the Sandinistas are bar back in power. I mean, different governments of Nicaragua because of have have not been able to to succeed, you know, in in removing Nicaragua out of poverty, you know, and because of that, uh, the situation is 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 very serious. I mean, I remember that only probably from 1994 to 98, when we were in the government, Nicaragua elected a woman, you know, Victoria Barrios de Chamorro. We had a very, very cordial relations, you know, I mean, they, we didn't have really conflicting issues and we were able to advance many things. But other than that, when Nicaraguan's leaders feel that they have to solve their local problems and they don't do it, the easy way they find out is to try to create a crisis with Costa Rica to, to, so that people can, I mean, to exploit the nationalistic sentiments of the people. You know, that's very common in many ways. Many countries do that. I mean, when you have a problem inside, well, create an international crisis and you know that, that you will have your people behind because that becomes the priority. And that's the big challenge, you know, between Costa Rica and Nicaragua right now that I would say that cost Nicaraguan leaders do not, you know, cooperate fully. I mean, we are trying to do our part right now in this administration, but we would expect Nicaragua to do the same. For example, all Central American countries, we integrate what we call the Central American system of integration, you know? I mean, for three or four months now, Guatemala, Belize, El Salvador, Honduras, Panama, the Dominican Republic, and Costa Rica, which are part of the system, we come to all the meetings. Nicaragua is not coming to any of those meetings for two reasons. First, because for them it's a priority to be part of the ALBA, the alliance led by Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and Castro in Cuba. So for them it's more important that ideological alliance than their regional partners. And second, because remember that we had a, an episode with the interruption of the Honduran uh, political system that the president uh, resigned, he fled to Costa Rica, then he came back to the Brazilian embassy in Honduras. In the end, elections took place, even in the middle of that instability. So now the new regime of Honduras is recognized by most Latin countries, by the US, by most European countries, but not by Nicaragua, not by Brazil, not by Argentina, not by Venezuela, not by Cuba, not by Ecuador, not by Bolivia. And that means that whenever there is a meeting with Hondurans on the table, Nicaraguans are not coming. So, so that creates a big problem because we are, you know, we are trying to, I mean, that, that already happened, you know, elections took place and that's over. I mean, we need to, to move forward and Honduras is a very poor country and they need our, our support. You have a very high literacy rate, and yet you mentioned that one of the country's challenges includes reforms in your educational system. Could you talk about the things that you think your country needs to do, assuming that money was no object? Yeah, I think that one of the big problems that we have is to create patterns that we inherited from our colonial system, you know? When the Spaniards came to Latin America, you know, in the 16th century, 17th, 18th century, unlike the Europeans who came to the United States, the Spaniards brought very entrenched traditions, you know, that among other things included a very elitist education, you know. I mean, you need to memorize things, and that's all what you need. They brought, for example, very strong religious values, and that's why the Catholic religion, still in Costa Rica, is the official uh, religion of the state. That will probably change. Our Ministry of Foreign Affairs is formally is called Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Worship. So we deal not only with international issues, but with all the relations with the churches. But traditionally, it was just mainly the Catholic Church. We are about to renegotiate the treaty with the Holy See, you know, with the Vatican, which for all purposes is a state, you know, in the in dip diplomatic world. And they have already sent messages to us that they would like that paragraph in the Constitution to be eliminated, you know, because it, uh, in a way it's harmful, even for the Catholic Church, that, that we have just an official religion, you know, when right now, you know, there are many religions operating in Costa Rica. It's not like 30 years ago, you know, but right now there is a, a lot of 
diversity, you know, in, in our beliefs. And so education is, is part of those things that have been inherited to us, you know, since the colonial times, you know. And we feel that we need to adapt education to the new times, you know. I mean, in which we are living in a very fast-paced world you know, with a lot of high technology, where the internet, the revolution of, uh, you know, of, of communications and everything. And in a way, we cannot have the same education that we had before when the, the world is taking place in, 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 in real time. You know? So and that takes time. You know, the, our teachers are not probably prepared to face that change, that dimension. You know? For example, we need to languages. You know, for, for many years, I mean, teaching languages was not important in our ed educational system. We know that that's important nowadays. So literacy is not what it used to be. When I said the 90% literacy is probably that people know how to write and read. However, if you nowadays in Costa Rica, if you don't know a second language, probably you are not going to have opportunities to a good job. You know? And so in that way that I said that that education needs to go a step further, you know, to, to be in tune with the challenges of the present global world. I appreciate those words about uh, teaching language and how important it is, because I did that for about 40 years. But I really want to ask you something more about deforestation and how Costa Rica kind of turned around what I saw as a visitor there several times, a trend that looked uh, kind of scary between agriculture and uh, a lot of development, especially for the tourism sector, uh, whether it was resorts on the on the beaches or golf courses or whatever. So it seemed like a real threat to the ecosystem. And I'm just wondering, um, how you turn that around? There are still some threats still. It's not the situation is not entirely solved. But my Minister of Foreign Affairs was um, lecturing in Japan and Korea recently. And he showed uh, two maps, one from 20, 25 years ago, and one now, of satellite pictures you know, that show the difference. And I think that was mainly due to public policies that were more restrictive in the way that people could use land you know, and well, some incentives for people who, who planted trees as well. We use the planting trees also as a way to, to do CO2 emission uh, equity arrangements with other countries. For example, the first joint implementation agreement that was ever signed between two countries in the world for CO2 purposes was between Costa Rica and Norway, you know. And that began like a tendency, you know, that f it was very stimulating for some Costa Rican farmers to start growing trees again because they were making money out of that. Not only just were doing it just because of the, of the altruistic consideration, but just because it was a good business as well. And so the government started to implement that, also strengthening of our protected areas system, national parks system. And in fact, many other things, I mean, the task is not completed, and of course there are always threats, because there is that uh, dilemma between what kind of tourism we should pursue. I mean, sometimes people say, well, that Costa Rica is a champion in ecotourism. Well, not every project in Costa Rica is ecotourism. I mean, ecotourism is, r is really a very distinctive category. I mean, sometimes you see a hotel that has some parrots inside and, 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 and nice rooms on the top of the tree, that not necessarily means that that's an ecotourist project. I mean, ecotourism means other things. But I would say that Costa Rica has been able to, to succeed as, as a nature-oriented you know, country, which is different from ecotourism. I mean, we have ecotourist things, but we're still debating, you know, we, what we don't want to, to become is to, to be another Caribbean country that offers only sun and beaches, or so we don't want that. We don't want to become a casino-oriented country. Some, some congressman at some point presented, okay, Costa Rica could make a lot of money, it becomes another Las Vegas or Reno. We don't want that. So we, of course, don't want that. And we are trying to, to, to because we know that casino industry brings other social problems as well, you know, brings 
other things that we don't want. You know? And so in a way, we, we, we are trying to preserve our cultural heritage and environmental heritage by pursuing certain ways, but that's, that's, that's not easy. You know, that's, that remains still a, a problem and because we need to, for example, in Costa Rica, public beaches, all the beaches are public. You know? I mean, a hotel in Costa Rica cannot have a, a private beach. You know? Sometimes they are very tricky and they try to restrict the access to some tourists, but legally, I mean, no tourist or no Costa Rican or no foreigner should be you know, detained if they want to go on a public beach. I mean, so, and we want to control and regulate the constructions. You know, and we don't want like 25 story hotels you know, in the middle of, n of a national park or in the middle of nature, you know, because that, that's not consistent with the image we want to, to pursue. And, and there are other things. For example, now that you say that, we have a big problem ahead of us. Costa Rica needs to build a couple of more electric dams in the next 25 years in order to, to guarantee the electricity. Right now, 95% of our electricity doesn't come from petroleum. It comes from water, from wind, and from geothermal. So that's a big thing, that we don't depend on importing our oil from Venezuela and Mexico for our hydroelectrical needs. But because of the demand and the consumption and all that, we need to, to work in producing more electricity. And there is a, an area in southern Costa Rica where we have decided that could be the site for a, one or two of those projects. If those projects take place, a lot of the nature will be you know, erased and a lot of the very few still indigenous populations, reservations that is, exist there will be also you know, disappear. So, well, where to get the balance, how, how to do that? You know? For example, there is a lot of gold mines in Northern Costa Rica. We know that millions and millions of dollars that we, want, we could do with that. And the last administration granted a concession to a Canadian company which is exploiting the mine. Well, President Laura Chinchilla said that she was not going to give any more permissions to that and she was going to change the law so that no more gold will be exploited. So some people probably will say, well, that's crazy. I mean, you have, but we don't want to be such an economy. President Chinchilla was meeting with the new president of Colombia not so long ago when she went to his inauguration in August. And President Santos of Colombia said, yeah, we want to do this, we want to do this, we want. And President Chichi said, President, how are you going to finance that? Well, gas, petroleum, and gold. <laughs> For, because that's the natural answer you know, that other countries will take. We know that we have oil in the Caribbean of Costa Rica, but we have taken the decision not to exploit it. You know, because that would not be consistent with our other image, you know, that would ruin our nature. So we know we have rich costs in a way, probably Christopher Columbus didn't know about it, but rich costs probably meant that there was oil and gold and many things, but um, 600 years later, we don't want to be that kind of rich cost. I mean, we prefer to be a rich cost, maybe because of our nature, of our people, of our culture. Are you optimistic that at some point in the future there may exist a uh, Latin American Union or a Central American Union as there now is a European Union? It's a very interesting question. Well, Latin American Union probably is more far away because you know it's I have I have been teaching you know in recent years even for American students who come to Costa Rica and study abroad programs. One of my courses was Latin American politics, you know, and. Latin America is not just one single Latin America. There are many Latin Americans, you know, because when you take countries like Brazil, Brazil is a continent itself. I don't know if you are aware, but Brazil is bigger than the continental United States. In other words, Brazil is bigger than the US without Alaska and Hawaii. I mean, can you imagine that? So when, for example, Brazil is there at the UN and, and we request, for example, let just give me a, we have a summit of Ibero-American leaders next December. You know, Ibero-American leaders means all the leaders from Latin America, Mexico to Argentina, plus Portugal and Spain. 
that was initiated 20 years ago by the King of Spain. So every year we have a meeting and they discuss some political issues, integration issues and all that. Well, this year Central American countries are threatening with not going to Argentina if Honduras is not invited because the president of Argentina, Cristina Fernandez, does not recognize the new government of Honduras, so she's, she's threatening with not inviting Honduras. So we, the small Central American countries, maybe in solidarity, we might not go to Argentina. Well, what do you think happened in the recent UN? My foreign minister, the foreign minister of Guatemala, the foreign minister of Panama, met with the foreign ministers of Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Argentina. And according to my boss, I mean, it was a very, very uh, tough meeting, you know? Why? Because for countries for Brazil and Argentina, they don't care about Central America, you know? They consider big countries enough. So with those circumstances, a political or an economic union among Latin, in, within Latin America is very difficult because some countries consider themselves very f far bigger than others, you know? especially Brazil, Argentina, I wouldn't say Mexico, I would say Mexico because of its proximity to the US and Central America, in a way Mexico, we, are, we have good relations with, with Mexico, with current President Calderon, we know he's facing a very tough situation and he's doing all what he can to, to solve all the threats you know, against his country. But uh, in the case of Central America, yeah, we have beginning with a small association that we call SICA, the Central American System of Integration, but we are succeeding more in economic terms or in integration of, for example, the electric grid. All the countries from Panama to Guatemala are interconnected, you know, so if Nicaragua doesn't have uh, electricity enough, they can buy it from Panama or from Guatemala or from Costa Rica, you know. So in things like that, uh, we're trying to introduce very mega projects. When we go to China next month, we will be traveling in the high-speed train from Beijing to Tianjin, which goes to 250 miles per hour. And we were thinking, you know, well, why not think in a train that goes from Panama to Guatemala, you know, at that speed one day. You know? So in things like that, probably we, we, we can dream, we can, we can do something in a logistical corridor from Panama all the way to Mexico. So thinking in our trade, thinking in our possibilities. I see very far a political union. I mean, we are not that far from Europe. And you, you may say, well, Europe, they have been able to do that even with that, the language barriers, because a uh, Greek speaks Greek, an Estonian speaks Estonian, a Swedish speaks Swedish, and they were able to relinquish their currency, in some of them in favor of euro. I don't see that happening, and probably Costa Rica will be the most reluctant country for that. Some countries are integrating very well themselves, for example, Guatemala and El Salvador. For example, if a Guatemalan goes to Honduras, so Nicaraguan goes to El Salvador, they don't need a passport anymore. You can go with your ID. But Costa Rica will not allow that. Costa Rica still requires visa to Nicaraguans who want to visit Costa Rica, you know, because of the immigration thing. So in a way, Costa Rica puts some restrictions to the other countries, like the U.S. puts restrictions to all of us. You know, I need a visa to come to the, to you, to the U.S., you know, and because even with a diplomatic passport, I still need a a visa, because that's, that's the way. Uh, two weeks ago, we decided that in order to attract Chinese tourism to Costa Rica, you know, we decided that those Chinese people who have already visa to Japan and Korea will be allowed to enter Costa Rica. We do that already with some countries who have American visa and European Union visas. So we are extending that privilege to those people who have Korean, Japanese, and in a few months, we will do that with Australia and New Zealand. Those people who have visas to enter Australia and New Zealand will not need a visa to enter Costa Rica because those countries are very restrictive. You know, It's very hard to, f to get a visa to enter Australia, for example, or New Zealand. So in, in answering your question, it's, I see a difficult to have a political union, easier to have more an economic and, and, and a trade union. As somebody that's uh, involved politically with your country, I want to thank you for the efforts that you and other people have made to um, continue the work that uh, Fuentes did by um, uh, eliminating the, the armed forces. And I was wondering if you could um, uh, tell me how that's helped your country to prosper and 
and how you maintain that. Um, it's a really beautiful goal of yours. How to maintain what? The uh, and how you maintain the, that goal of keeping the armed forces out. Oh, okay. um, or well, I would say that for the new generations, that's not a question anymore. I mean, it's, I would not conceive any Costa Rican right now of the new generation thinking that organizing an army again is a possibility. That's out of the question. You know? And one way that we explain the peace dividend that we have had is yeah, in the institutions we have, you know, I mean, the way that we have achieved some, I mean, uh, our human development indicators are as high as those in this country or in other countries, you know. So our life expectancy is higher than here in the U.S., you know, for example, it's more than 80 years old, you know. Our infant mortality is only eight out of 1,000, you know. So we've been able to do that because we invested you know, money that otherwise was spent in military in other countries, we were able to, to channel that money to education and health and infrastructure. One difference between Costa Rica and other Latin countries is that still a lot of, pop, a lot of towns in many Latin American countries don't have electricity. It's very dark. I mean, you only find well-lighted nice in the capital city, you know. In Costa Rica, the whole country is still with electricity and with access to water, you know, with potable water, with drinkable water, you know. And that was only possible through many years of, of progress, you know, investing all this money in, in these things. I mean, we didn't have to spend money in arms and weapons, and so the government decided to spend that money in, in, in education, in health programs, you know, for the people, and especially preventive medicine is very important. I mean, in some other countries have the big crisis because they didn't prevent, and they have to spend money there in how to cure, you know, diseases. And in the case of Costa Rica, we were able to do a lot of preventive medicine, you know, vaccination to the small kids when it was the time, you know, and good nutrition in the schools, you know, by giving, providing milk and vitamins to the kids. I mean, it's a lot of things combined, you know, that are part of our process, you know, we don't conceive the Costa Rican system without those benefits for our children, you know, and for our hospitals. I mean, system is not perfect. I mean, for example, my sister called me today to tell me that, that for example, the nanny who used to be her nanny, you know, we, she takes care of her, she's an 85-year-old woman, um, she needs some tests, you know, in her, because she has some circulation problems. And my sister said, well, I need to take her this Wednesday because if I don't use the appointment for this Wednesday, they will give me an appointment for, for June of 2011, which she might be dead by then, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, we, I mean, so sometimes there are some inefficiencies, you know, in the system, but at least people know that they know where to go, you know? You know that, I mean, each month, my salary does not come complete to me because I get deducted the pension, I get deducted the health, and, and the same they do with my employer, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So both the ministry and myself, we, every month we, not donate, but we do part of our salary goes to that, whether we use it or not. But we know that if, we, if I don't use it, somebody else will use it. In a way, that health care system works on a principle of solidarity, you know, it's not what I, may be affected or if I may use it or not, is that somebody else may, may use it too. So and that's how it works. That principle of solidarity is at risk. I mean, until 1980, Costa Ricans were very strong in that principle of solidarity. More and more with the global economy, Costa Ricans are becoming more individualistic, more competitive, you know, so they don't care much about the others. I mean, it cares much about himself or herself, and that's, I think, a universal problem that we see in this competitive global world. That's, the global economy has brought a lot of innovations, a lot of inventions, but has brought a lot of problems too. You know, people are more selfish nowadays than they were before. Any other question? Yes? With the lack of the military, um, how is it possible to uh, maintain the country as it is without inroads from other countries? Uh, is it a strong uh, 
neighborhood watch on a, na a national scale? Is it uh, respect of other nations, uh, fear of uh, censure by other nations? Uh, um, um, how is it able to maintain that uh, kind of security? Well, in the absence of uh, on security forces, on armed forces, you know, Costa Rica relies on the multilateral system. You know, two or three times Costa Rica was about to be invaded by other countries since we don't have an army, and Costa Rica invoked an inter-American treaty of reciprocal assistance that says that if one country is unfairly invaded the other countries of the system will come. So at some point in time, the United States was ready to come and help Costa Rica. In other circumstances, Venezuela and Panama were ready to do it, and, never hap and that never happened. I mean, Costa Rica wasn't, didn't need that. So we feel that the best army of Costa Rica is having no army. I mean, it would be very silly for other countries to try to, to do something to Costa Rica, and that's why when I presented all those slides about our work at the UN, you know, the disarmament, peace, the human rights, is because we, we feel that our natural defense in the world without having an army is just to fight for those things in the multi multilateral organization. That if anything comes against Costa Rica, well, we will go to the UN, we will go to the OAS. That's the way it should be. First of all, Ambassador, I, I know with happiness that um, your current president is a political scientist, and I wonder if you could export that to the United States. Um, <laughs> joking, joking aside, uh, I just wonder, uh, you know, the United States does not allow the ICC to have jurisdiction over our citizens, our, especially our military. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we're, we're not even close to frankly, disarming from a nuclear standpoint, despite some of the things President Obama has said. So, you know, we don't seem to be fully embracing global climate change treaties, although, again, maybe some, some changes coming uh, here. So my question is, you know, these are policies that are sometimes at direct, direct odds with Costa Rican policies, and of course you have a, a good relationship with the United States, but, you know, what can a, a country like Costa Rica do what does a country like Costa Rica do um, to try to influence a country like the United States to, to change policy in the international system? Well, it's, it's hard to do. I mean, we, we have friendly relations. I mean, and we, in the past, we have worked together in, in many ways. I remember that when Costa Rica was one of the first countries to ratify the Kyoto Protocol on climate change in 1997, you know, my president was the only president who came to the summit. Vice President Gore was there, so in a way there was some commitment to do things, but of, of course the United States is a big power. There's a lot of interests here that will resist to change things in military or in climate change for obvious reasons. You know, I mean, the military industry, in, not only in the US, but in the other four countries that are permanent members of the Security Council, you know, are, are, are big. I mean. It's, it's a reality. I mean, sooner or later you need a war for all those weapons to be used. I mean, that's the sad reality. I mean, that's, that's how it is. You know, and, and same with the climate change. I mean, the car industry is very powerful. You know, and the oil industry is very powerful, it's, so it won't be easy. So it would be very arrogant to say what can Costa Rica teach or say to the United States because, I mean, that's... That's, that's not the way, but, but at least, I mean, we can, we can share our concerns, we can share our views. Let's hope, I, I know that during the dinner that Secretary General Ban Ki-moon of the United Nations hosted to all the presidents that night, last Wednesday night, uh, I, my ambassador told me that my president was there at some point, there were several tables. At some point, President Obama came from his table directly to her and she wanted to meet her in person, you know, and invited her to come to Washington on an official visit, okay? Well, opportunities like that, probably that will happen next year. Uh, there has been a long time since a Costa Rican president visits the U.S. on, a, on an official visit. Well, we'll probably use those opportunities to, to, to talk about our vision and to, just to try to contribute to, 
to world peace and world preservation of the environment. And I know that the U.S. leaders, one way or another, I mean, they have been very helpful to, to Costa Rica in many ways, both Republicans and Democrats throughout history. They have been very friendly, very receptive to Costa Rican concerns, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure there will be no exception this time. We, we hope so, and we hope that could be a good dialogue between our leaders in the near in the near future because I mean not only for the sake of Costa Rican US relations but also because I think the the world needs to reach more, you know, understandings, you know, that the situation is is, is really is really bad. I mean, that the planet is in a way under under threat in many ways, mm -hmm. both because of the environment and because of the nuclear capabilities of, of many countries and we, we we have things in common i mean last thursday i mean i wasn't in the hall but we instructed our ambassador to walk out of the room of the united nations when the president of iran started to say nasty things about israel and about the us and about september 11. so i wasn't there but our ambassador there had instructions to walk out and we did and the day later, the U.S. Deputy Ambassador asked us, "What did we do?" And we said, "Oh, yeah, she, she was very happy, you know, to know that Costa Rica did it without any pressure. You know, we did it because of our conviction you know, that no leader has the right to to talk that way about other states in the United Nations. You know, and so on. We did last year, and, and we did again this year." But at the same time, two years ago, we decided to move our embassy from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, because according to the United Nations, I mean, Jerusalem is still has a special international status, and only Costa Rica and El Salvador used to have their embassy in Jerusalem. Well, our previous administration changed that. Of course, that wasn't a happy news for the Israeli government, you know, but we thought that it was the best thing to do in order to bring closer our relations to the moderate Arab world. I mean, of course, we don't want for now relations with Iran or Libya or things like that, but we feel that we could build relations with moderate countries like Morocco, with Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Jordan, Egypt, you know, because, well, this is how the world is. I mean, the United Nations is a big family and uh, we have to talk to, to everybody. I mean, it does, doesn't matter if you have things in common. You know, many. I was in the halls last week, I mean, and I started to recognize a lot of the friends I had worked with, you know, in the United Nations in the last two years, and suddenly I was going about to go to my seat, and suddenly I feel that somebody does like this, you know, a hug, and I was, was scared, and it was, and it was the Cuban ambassador to the UN, you know, saying, well, what are you doing here, you know, it's happy to see you again, you know, and so, beyond disputes, uh, beyond disagreements, because very rarely we have things in common with Cuba in the United Nations, that doesn't mean that we don't have personal relations, you know, we deal with all of them all the time, you know, so that's something that I learned of my experience at the UN is that, I mean, you, you need to be sometimes tolerant, you know, and respectful of different thoughts and different beliefs and different religions, different cultures, but that has, people need to know that they have limits, you know? And, and sometimes presidents like the Iranian presidents go beyond those limits, and that's not acceptable. Yeah. Well, I'd like us to give a, a round of applause to Ambassador Hernandez, thank you so much. And I'd like to mention uh, that we are, we do have some cookies and I think some coffee uh, in the terrace room just when you go to the right. And if you'd like to continue the conversation with Ambassador Hernandez, please join us and we look forward to seeing you. Better be Costa Rican coffee, not Colombian coffee. <laughs> <laughs>